Everybody, I bless you guys. Thank you all so much for coming in. Everybody that's watching all over the world, I bless you in Jesus' name. Everybody say hello to the Houston campus. Everybody say hello, Houston. Hey, man, we love you guys. We're proud of y'all, proud of the food outreaches that y'all are doing. Proud of how you guys are standing together. Love y'all and bless you. Guys, if you would, please open up your Bibles to 1 Samuel chapter 17 is where we're at. Everybody's like, oh, 1 Samuel 17. 1 Samuel chapter 17. This epic story of David and Goliath is found in 1 Samuel chapter 17. And it's such a great story. And it's not, sadly, a lot of people think that this, this story is just a myth. That's part of the mythos of the Bible, that it's just, it's just ridiculous. No, no, this is legit, and this is real. This actually happened. And it's a game changer. It's a game changing day, and it still, to this day, has the power to change our lives over and over and over again if we can look at it as the Word of God. Now, a lot of people just think it's some kind of a weird allegory. Well, it's an allegory. You can certainly use this in the way of an allegory and say, well, yeah, we've all got giants to face, and we've all got big things to face, and this thing will actually give us principles. Here's what I want to just tell you this. This is the Word of God. And friends, we have to, we got to know this. I was saying last week at our Easter service, which by the way, that was pretty, that was awesome, wasn't it? It was great. And telling everybody, hey, you know what? The most important event in all of human history is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And the second one is when you begin to actually believe it. You have to believe the word of God. You have, you have to own the impact of the word of God. Nobody else is going to make you make a big deal out of the things of King Jesus. You have to make a big deal out of the things of King Jesus. Well, this is his word. So we're gonna, I'm actually gonna read through all, I'm gonna read through 50 verses of this today. And then we're gonna, I'm gonna stop and we're gonna talk about several things. And then I'm gonna wrap this up by showing you something really awesome that happened this week because I was like, no, that's a word. That is a prophetic marker. This is something that's real and I'm running with it. Amen. Okay, 1 Samuel chapter 17 says, now, the Philistines gathered together their armies to battle, and they were gathered at Sakah, which belongs to Judah, and they encamped between Sakah and Azekah in Ephus Damon. I think I went to school with that guy, oh, Ephus Damon, y'all know him? <laughs> Verse two, and Saul and the men of Israel were gathered together, and they encamped in the valley of Elah, and they drew up in battle array against the Philistines, and the Philistines stood on a mountain on one side, and the Israel stood on a mountain on the other side with a valley between them. The Valley of Eli is still in Israel, and out of all the things I've seen in Israel, I've never actually been here to this spot, and I definitely gotta go there. I, I look at it all the time on Google Maps. I looked at it yesterday, and on Google Maps, again, it's, it's easily identifiable. There is still a valley there. There's nothing built in a valley. It's farmland, and this is actually depicting the reality of what happens when there is an invasion that is imminent, because this is east of Ashkelon, and it's, the Bible says that it belongs to Judah. Now, I, I've done a lot of stomping around in Ashkelon, and you and I have built bomb shelters there for children because they get bombed so much coming out of the Gaza Strip. And so we've, we, we build bomb shelters there, and we make them fun places for kids to go and wait for the fallout. Isn't that terrible that that's still going on today? And it's like, well, let's at least, man, I don't want this to look like some World War I bunker, man. We want it to be colorful and we want fun stuff to be in there. We, we put coloring books in there. We put all kinds of stuff in there. And uh, the mayor of Ashkelon has actually given this church the keys of the city. Isn't that cool? Yeah. Well, Ashkelon's a really cool place. Well, this is, this is directly east of that. So Ashkelon belonged to the Philistines. And it was where they worshiped the fish god, Dagon. And it was where they were, it's the, it's, Ashkelon is the place where, where Samson came into the temple and pushed apart the pillars. You can actually see the ruins of that temple and you can literally see the two support pillars that broke off at about knee high. You can literally stand in the place where Samson stood. That's pretty that gum cool. Well, this was not there. This was over in King Saul's territory. This was over in the land of Judah. And these Philistines have invaded them. And it's like, okay, well, we're all going to go to war. And then it says that they met in this Valley of Elah. The Valley of Elah means the Valley of the Terebinth trees or the Valley of the Philistine oak trees or the Valley of the Palestinian oak trees. The word Philistine and Palestine is the same word. 
There was an emperor that actually said, hey, what's the most hated enemy of Israel? And he said, the Philistines. He said, okay, I'm going to remap out this place, and I'm going to call this place Philistine or Palestine. And that's where that word comes from. It was the Romans just hating the Jews and wanting to rename it after their enemies. And so they get together and they're in this place. And like anytime that you see the terebent tree or the Eli tree, it's translated different ways in English for us. Or this, this Palestinian or Philistine oak, whenever you see it, some crazy things always happen whenever you see these trees. And one of them is, you know, like Absalom got his hair caught in one right? You guys know about all that? There's a whole bunch of things. Isaiah talks about, he literally mentions it in the book of Isaiah, and he says, you know what? I'm tired of your, of your Eli groves where you worship these idols, because they had all these giant, beautiful groves in this desert place of these giant oak trees, and they would set up idols underneath these things. So it's like, in the valley of Elah is a place of territory that the devil says is mine, but God is saying, I want that territory. Okay, y'all, are y'all still tracking with me? All right, and then verse four. <clears throat> and a champion, everybody say champion. champion. And a champion went out from the camp of the Philistines named Goliath from Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span. This word champion is only found here in the entire Bible, and it literally means half man. This, they sent out a half man. Well, what is he? He's a hybrid Nephilim human being. Now, if you've been hearing me, I was on a podcast last night. On, I, was on the cow, I was on the Cosmic Cowboy podcast last night. And I want to tell you, man, I was on there. Did you see it? Did you, have you seen any of it? It was fun, wasn't it? It was an hour and a half, an hour and a half of this guy asking me about giants. And are giants real? Do they still exist? What's up with DNA? Uh, what does that have to do with Jesus coming back? How does that fit into the days of Noah? Yada, yada, yada. And I just sat there and I just went off for an hour and a half last night and it was so much fun. It was nice to be talking to somebody who's crazier than I am. <laughs> but if we're gonna look at this, the Bible, this word, cha- this word champion literally means half man or it means in between man. Isn't that something? So what is he? Goliath is what people in the Western world would recognize as a manifestation in the natural of something that happened between a covenant of a human being and a demon. And without going way off into all that, that's what he is. Now, these guys come from the Anakins. They come from, they come from the Mount Hermon area. And if you go to Deuteronomy chapter three and it talks about Og and his Nephilim sex magic bed that he had that Moses took over and he gives all this stuff and he talks about all this crazy stuff that goes on with it and how that they defeated Og. Okay, his people, they literally hired out as mercenaries and they hired out as mercenaries to certain groups, to the Philistines, to the Amalekites, to the Jebusites, uh, the Cellulites. No, they weren't there. That's my battle, Never mind. I promise you there's a demon in that tribe. <laughs> and they would, they, would, they, would, and they would literally live among them and they would hire out as mercenaries and they were, they were fierce and they were monsters. They're monsters. And not only would they fight for them, but they would also consume everything that those tribes had, including their women, and they would bear other children. And so their DNA was totally messed up. And it wasn't from the line of Adam, it was from the line of Satan. And that's why God Almighty would say, when you go among the Amalekites or the Jebusites or any of these other cats, wipe them out. Do not mess with them. Do do not feel sorry for them. Do not go into covenant with them. I want you to wipe them out. And then he would also say, I want you to also wipe out their animals. Like, why would you do that? Because of this sexual demonic thing that they did in the animal kingdom and also too within, within human beings. He's like, wipe them out. It was that way in the days of Moses. I'm sorry, in the days of Noah. It was that way with Sodom and Gomorrah. Like anytime that you see God Almighty wiping out a people group, it's because it's not his creation. God has all kinds of patience for his creation. He has no patience for what is not his. It's like, oh, Sodom and Gomorrah, well, that was because they were homosexuals. No, that is not why God wiped them out. 
The Bible says in the book of Ezekiel exactly why he wiped them out, but you need to hear me say this. You know, everybody's like, well, when the two angels came to rescue them, whenever they came, whenever they came to get Lot, and Jesus said, as it was in the days of Lot and as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be when Jesus comes back. Okay, so what happened is, the men of the city gathered together and, you know, they were like, give us those two angels. We want them. And so everybody's like, ah, they're just crazy homosexuals. No, no, they wanted angels. It wasn't because they were men. It's because they were angels. And that was part of their religion. They weren't scared of them at all. And they were used, they were used to these demonic angels showing up and promising them a leg up on all kinds of power and all kinds of crazy stuff. And they engaged in that and they became powerful beings because of that. And so, so much so that they wanted, to, they, they said, bring out those angels that we may know them. Like, okay. And they were like, uh, no, you're barking up the wrong tree, pal. I'm for, you're, in fact, I'm fixing to just wipe y'all out. Well, this pattern is all the way through the word of God. It's Genesis 3.15. It's a seed war that there's two different seeds. You and I are of the seed of God Almighty through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. We are, we are loyal to King Jesus and to Yahweh God. And a big part in these last days is, of, is we got to learn how to walk in the power of the Holy Spirit and in the fear of the Lord. In the fear of the Lord says, I'm in the army. I belong to his tribe. I will not give myself to anything else. You can't have my DNA. You can't have how I think. You cannot have my actions. You can't have any of those things. I belong to the Lord Jesus Christ. It has to do with loyalty. The fear of the Lord is a big part of that is loyalty. Everybody thinks that it's about your behavior. Your behavior is important, but that's not what it's all about. When the Bible says that God Almighty loved King David because he was a man after God's own heart, it doesn't mean that he always acted like God. He was a man that was completely loyal to whatever God Almighty wanted. And so it's like, man, I'm looking for people that are like that. Well, this champion or this half man comes out and his name is Goliath, and the Bible says that he's six cubits in a span. He was a giant. Now, people argue, and if you get on the worldwide waste of time and listen to all of the limp-wristed, faithless people that'll say, well, he wasn't actually a giant, you know that. No, no, he was actually a giant. And just because you don't have the capacity to believe it does not negate the fact that he was a giant. It just means that you just don't have the capacity to believe it, because you're so smart. <laughs> so it says that he was six cubits in a span. Well, everybody knows that there's an argument over, over what, a, what, a, what six cubits is. Nobody knows. No, everybody knows what it is. There's a cubit, and then there's a royal cubit. A cubit, like, well, nobody really knows what that is because it's from your elbow down to the end of your middle finger. That's what that is. Well, no, we know what that is. It's basically 18 inches. If it's a royal cubit, then it's 21 inches. So it's like, okay, so we're going to do the math on that. What is that? It's about nine and a half feet tall. I'm going to tell you right now, that's a big one. <sighs> what? So, <clears throat> he is a monster. And if you're like, well, I just, has there anybody ever seen a giant? Yeah, lots of people have seen giants. You know, Andre the Giant, I watched him when I was a kid. <laughs> Andre the Giant was actually seven foot two. And then the guy who, who played Chewbacca, Peter Mayhew, who married my cousin and you know, knew him, you know, he was seven foot two or he was seven foot three. And uh, Angelique just passed away the uh, week before last. And her funeral was last Tuesday. And by the way, from all my cousins that are watching, I surely love you guys. Love y'all so much and stand with you. Y'all are good sisters to her. I'm so, so, so proud of y'all. Okay, my eye hose are starting to leak. I got to quit it. So... Um, Peter was seven foot two or seven foot three. And I mean, I, I knew him personally. He's a big one, I promise you. Um, but you're like, yeah, but that's a long way from nine foot six. Let me show you what's not a long way from nine foot six. Guys, this is Robert Wadlow. And I want to show you guys a picture of him. That's him right there. He's in Guinness Book of World Records. And since uh, they've been keeping those records, that's the, the tallest living man that has been documented by Guinness Book of World Records. He's eight foot 11. Yeah. You know, he only lived to be 22 years old. I'm sorry for that. He was still growing at the time that he died. And he died in 1940. 
and he's eight foot 11. He weighed 439 pounds. Isn't that something? Do you know what his shoe size was? 36 AA. That's bigger than Ben Brewer's foot. And his world famous Jurassic Park toenail. This is not gonna be on television. We cannot do this. So, like, well, okay, well, I can believe eight foot 11, but I can't believe nine foot six. Why? Why is that? What, what's wrong with you? I mean, we're really trying, you need to just ask yourself, what's wrong with me? <laughs> if you can believe eight foot 11, why can't you believe nine foot six? It's not that big of a jump. It's really and truly not. And that guy wasn't Nephilim. That guy had a pituitary gland issue. This is Nephilim. This has, it's a hybrid. He's a half man. He's, he's got supernatural qualities in a physical body. Why can't you believe that he's nine foot six? Why do you got to argue with that? Because you're scared. Right on. Scared is going to interfere with how brilliant you are. I want to tell you, learn the word of God and believe the word of God. Verse five, it says in verse five, and he had a bronze helmet on his head and he was armed with a coat of mail. The weight of the coat of mail was 5,000 shekels of bronze. That's about 125 pounds. He had a bronze armor on his legs and a bronze javelin between his shoulders. Now the staff of his spear was like a weaver's beam and a weaver's beam and an iron spearhead weighed 600 shekels. That's about 16, 17 pounds, All right? And, uh, and he had a shield bearer, an armor bearer that went out before him. So Goliath has a height of six cubits in a span. The head of his spear weighs 600 shekels, and he also wore six pieces of iron. That's a 666 stamped on him. Verse eight, then he stood and he cried out to the armies of Israel and he said to them, why have you come out to line up for battle? Am I not a Philistine? You the, and y'all the servants of Saul, choose a man for yourselves and let him come down to me. And if he's able to fight with me and kill me, well, then we'll be your servants. But if I prevail against him and if, and if I kill him, then you shall be our servants and you shall serve us. And the Philistines said, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that we might fight together. This is a principle that's called single combat. And throughout the history of warfare, there's been a lot of this that has actually happened. Um, one of my favorite uh, people is a guy by the name of John Smith, who actually was one of the founders of Jamestown. Y'all know, y'all heard about John Smith, right? Well, when he fought the Ottomans, he would get out and he had all of his mercenaries with him and they went out and they were fighting the Turks they were fighting the Ottoman Empire and they'd get out and he would look and like, I don't sure we can win this. Hang on a second, boys. And he'd go down and he would do the Valley of Eli thing. And he'd say, send me your captain, send me your dude and I'll fight him in hand-to-hand -hand combat. And it's like, okay, well that puts you in a precarious position because if, if, if John Smith goes out there and if he does that and says, I want that dude on that horse right there, get off your horse and let's get it on. What are you scared of? If the guy says no, then, well, number one, if he says yes, he's liable to person, personally get killed. If the guy says no, then all of his men know that he was not willing to fight for them. It's really a smart thing to do. John Smith did that three times, and all three times he won, and all three times he cut the heads off of those Ottoman Turks. Oh, he was a bad motor scooter. It was like, wow, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Well, okay, so, so he's saying, send me out a guy. Well, there was one guy that was obvious. It would be the king, right? Right? He said, send me out a guy. Like, no, it wouldn't be him, man. You need to be the, you actually ought to send out the biggest guy. Saul, the king, was the biggest guy. The Bible says that he was head and shoulders above everybody else. So for 40 days, this rant is going on. And for 40 days, all of his men are looking at him going, he's not willing to fight for us. They're starting to learn about the character of King Saul, and it ain't good. Now, what's amazing is in the chapter right before all this, David was anointed as king. Okay? And it's going to be a long time before anybody else recognizes He's the king, but, the, but Israel is now beginning to recognize that their king is not a very good leader and he does not have good character. Because the Bible says in verse 11, and when Saul and all of Israel heard the words of this Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. All right. First Samuel 9, 2 again says that he was literally, he literally stood head and shoulders above the rest of the crowd. King Saul did. Now, let's get back to 1 Samuel 17. 
Now David, who was the son of an Ephraite of Bethlehem, Judah, whose name was Jesse, who had eight sons, and a man was old. He was advanced in years and in the days of Saul. Now, the three oldest sons of Jesse had gone to follow Saul into battle, and the names of his three sons who went to battle were Eliab, the firstborn. Next to him was Abinadab, and the third was Shema. And David was the youngest. And the three oldest, well, they followed Saul. But David, occasionally, he went and he returned from Saul to feed his father's sheep at Bethlehem. Now, the Philistine drew near and presented himself 40 days, morning and evening. So every day they come out, they're like, okay, today's the day, man. Let's get it on. Let's get it on. Let's get it on. Rawr, no, you. Rawr, rawr, rawr. And they're out there right there. And then all of a sudden, the dude would come out, and he would just end it. And he'd say, oh, no, 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 no. We ain't going to do this. I just want one guy. I'm laying it all out. What's the, y'all didn't pick anybody? What, hey, Saul. Where's Saul? Where is the brother? And this goes on for 40 days, and they're just like, come on, man. This is bad, and we don't know what to do. And then Jesse said to his son David, Take now for your brothers an ephah of dried grain and three ten and ten big loaves of bread and run to your brothers of the camp and carry these ten cheeses to the captain of their, of their thousand and see how your brothers fare and bring back news of them. Now Saul and all they and all the men of Israel were in the valley of Eli and they were lining up to fight with the Philistines. So David rose early in the morning, left, left the sheep with the keeper, took the things, went as Jesse had commanded him, and he came to the camp as, as the army was going out to fight and shouting for battle. For Israel and in the Philistines had drawn up to battle within their battle array, an army against army, and David left his supplies in the hand of the supply keeper and he ran to the army and he came and greeted his brothers. You need to understand that up until this point in the story, he is Uber Eats. He, he's the cheese boy. And nobody knows who he is. He's like, Jesus, the Jesus is here. Hallelujah. And he's like, okay. So he, he's like, I'm just here to deliver cheese. That's all I'm here to do. And as he's talking to his brother, in verse 23, it says, there was the champion, the Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name, coming up from the armies of the Philistines, and he spoke according to the same words, and David heard him. This is the place in the movie where you, t- where you go tight on David's face, and he stops and he turns and looks, and I'm like, what the? Right? And then it says, and all the men of Israel, when they saw the man, they fled because they were, he's, they were dreadfully afraid. So the men of Israel said, have you seen this man who has come up? Surely he has come up to defy Israel. And it shall be that the man who kills him, the king is going to make him rich. Then he's going to give him his daughter, which is going to make him royalty. And he's going to give him his father's house exemption from taxes in Israel forever. Like, dang. And David spoke to the men who stood by him saying, what shall be done for this man who kills a Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? So here's what he's saying to the men. He's saying, he's saying, he's saying say it again, what you're going to get. Say it again, what you're going to get. Come on, rise up. He's not saying he's going to do it. He's telling them, why are you guys here hiding? Come on. Say it again, say it again. What are you going to get? You're going to get rich. You're going to become royalty and your family will never have to pay taxes again. Say it again, say it again. And he starts rallying the troops and he's saying, tell me again, tell me again. And David spoke to the men by him. Let's see, verse 27. And the people answered him in this manner saying, so shall it be done for the man who kills him. So he starts getting them to chant over and over and over again what the reward is. And he's trying to get a warrior to rise up because he's there to be the cheese boy. And he's just smart enough to go, no, listen, whoa, 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 did y'all not hear this? Did you not hear what just happened? No, listen, we'll say it again, say it again. And sometimes, guys, I wanna just tell you that. Sometimes you have got to make yourself remember what God Almighty has promised you. And you just go, no, let's just go over the promises of God one more time. Hey, man, let's just do this one more time. I just wanna go over the promises, say it again, say it again, say it again, say it again. Say it again. And he's telling them to do this. And they're also starting going, oh, we're gonna get rich, we're gonna get a woman, and we're gonna not have to pay taxes. Say it again, say it again. And he's getting them to do that. Well, his brother shuts him down. And it says, now Eliab, the oldest brother, heard when he spoke to the men. See, he's saying that to the men. He's getting the men to say it back to them. And Eliab's anger was aroused, uh, was aroused against David. And he said, why did you come down here? And with whom have you left those few sheep out in the wilderness? I know your pride and your insolence of heart, for you've come down to see the battle. Here's what his brother tells him. You're just trying to see one of us get killed. Go 
back to your sheep, boy. Drop off your cheese and get the heck out of here. Don't be trying to rile us up and get one of us killed. You just want to see a fight today. You live out there, you don't ever get to see nothing out there in the wilderness. You want to see a fight at our expense. Again, it's, David is not saying, let me be the champion. He's telling them, let a champion rise up among us. Come on, let's go. Now, I want to tell you, this is a very important part of the story because he could have got in a brawl with his brother at this point because he's in front of all the men and everybody's listening. This kid talked to him and then his brother comes marching out and gets in his grill. And right then in front of everybody, they could have gotten to, you know, a Johnny Cash brawl, the mud, blood, and the beer. And he picks his battles and he's like, no, this is not the fight that I'm going to fight. I think it's just so important that if you're going to fight the right battles, you got to be able to turn away from the wrong battles. Amen. And he's just looking because he doesn't answer his brother. He has nothing to say. He let his brother have the last word. And his brother comes out and accuses him of bad character and go, you just want to see one of these guys get killed. And it's like, get out of here. What are you doing? So David says, what have I done now? Is there not a cause? That, that frame has, that frame of mind has meant so much to me. Is there not a cause? I've thought about it so many different times when I've had to, I've had a big lump in my throat where I've been afraid and like, I don't want to take on another project. I don't want to, I don't know if we should get involved in this. I don't know if we should go to that place. I don't know. And then all of a sudden I just think, is this the heart of the Lord? Is there not a cause? And then I look around and I go, who else is going to do it if we don't? And I'm like, yeah, no, this is the cause of the Lord. And so it's his battle. I don't need to take this personally. I just need to take the kingdom to it. That's what I need to do. Verse 30. And then he turned from him towards another and he said the same thing. And these people answered him as the first ones did. So he turns from his brother and starts talking to all the people again going, is there not a cause? Am I wrong? Is this not a cause? Is this not something that God would have us to do? Come on, let a champion rise up. I'm rooting for you cats. Now when the words which David spoke was heard, they reported those words back to Saul and he sent for him. And then David said to Saul, let no man's heart fail because of him. Your servant will go and fight with the Philistine. The first time that we see that David is willing to fight this fight, the first time that we actually see it is once he comes into the presence of Saul. He was not there to fight the fight. He was there to deliver the cheese. He was the cheese boy. And then he starts telling the dudes, okay, guys, man, let's do this. Let's fight, let's fight, let's fight. And they didn't do it. And then they drug him to go see King Saul. And I can imagine King, Sa King Saul's like, I want to see this boy. Who is this out here rallying the troops? I can hear this. Dude, our troops are being rallied. First time in 40 days. Man, you know what? The, there's a momentum building. Hey, bring me this cat. Bring him to me. I want to see this guy. And in comes in David. And I could just see the rah, rah, rah. And it's like, what the? It says he comes in, and this is what David says to him. Let no man's heart fail because of him. Your servant will go and fight this Philistine. After seeing... <laughs> the cowardice of all the troops that he had so much respect for, after seeing the attitude of his brother, after hearing this monster defy God Almighty himself and the armies of the Most High God, he looked around and he just went, uh, you know what, I think I'll just do it myself. My goodness, guys, listen, God's gonna bring things to you and you're gonna have to come to a determination. I'm just gonna do this myself. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna leave this up to somebody else. I am going to do this thing. Oh man, that's a good word. And David said, well, Saul said, uh, and David said, um, um, and Saul said unto David, for you are not able to go against the Philistine to fight with him, for you are a youth, and, a, and he is a man of war from his youth. This is what David, Saul goes, really? You're here to, you're going to do it yourself? You know, there's a movie called The Godfather it came out in the 1970s, and there's this scene where Al Pacino was talking with his brothers, and there'd been a hit out on, on their daddy, and they're like, hey, man, we got to get this guy. We got to get this guy. I mean, he's like really bad. How can we get this guy? And Al Pacino says, I'll do it. And they all just start busting out laughing. And he's all beat up, and he's got his jaw wired shut. And he's like, no, no, I'll do it. And they're like, man, you can't do this. He goes, no, I can. I know exactly how to do this, and I want to do this. 
Okay, you multiply that by so much more. And this is what happens whenever David comes walking in. He says, I'll do it. I can do this. And he said, listen, kid, you're just a little boy. And by the time he was your age, he had already been killing folks. You, listen, no, you're, you're not able to do this. <laughs> Thanks. I'm proud of you. Awesome. But no, that's not going to happen. You never killed anybody. And he's been killing folks since he was younger than you is what he tells him. And David said to Saul, your servant he used to keep his father's sheep. And when a lion or a bear came out and took a lamb out of the flock, well, I went after it and I struck it. And I delivered the lamb from his mouth. And when it arose against me, I caught it by the beard and I struck it and I killed it. Your servant has killed both lion and bear. And this uncircumcised Philistine is going to be like one of them, seeing he has defied the armies of the living God. Moreover, he said, the Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear, he will deliver me from the hand of that filthy Philistine. I added the word filthy in there. He's like, no, I know how to deal with that. Okay, this, there's so many things in the Bible that I would love to have been a part of. I would love to be a fly on the wall or really don't want to be a fly, but I'll be, that's a manner of expression. I just want to be an invisible person that can speak ancient Hebrew and be sitting there and watch this because something happens in this that the narrative does not explain. But when he comes in, they're telling him, listen, man, you're just a kid and it ain't gonna happen. And you can't defeat this guy. He's been killing, he killed a ton of people by the time he was your age. And David looks him in the eye and says, oh, I can kill things. And the hair on the back of everybody's neck stood up and they started seeing something that they hadn't seen. He said, you know, nobody knows this about me, but I wanna tell you this. Sometimes God will send me a lion and when it comes after me, when it comes after my sheep, I chase it down with this stick. And you know what I do? I beat it to death with it. And then when it comes after me, I just grab it, I get right in its face. And I open up its mouth and I cram this thing down its throat. And this weird thing between me and God privately, sometimes, man, I'm telling you, I'm faster than any animal you've ever seen. And I can kill things. And I've done it with lions and I've done it with bears. And I know what it's like to be in the hand of a filthy animal and to just pull it right out of its socket. I do it all the time. And I want to tell you, God will be with me and he'll deliver me from the paw of that monster. Now, the next verse says, and Saul said to David, go and the Lord be with you. Okay, do you understand something changed in the room? And I don't know exactly what happened. The Bible just gives a little bit of his speech, but he tells him, no, no. See, I want to just tell you this. You have to have a powerful walk with God privately because the day will come. You're going to need to know God in the public arena and you're going to have to call upon who God is to you privately. I, I so wish I could hear how he said it without it being translated. And he goes, no, man, listen, I'm going to tell you all something that you don't know. I can kill things like nobody you have ever seen. Nobody knows this. I know I'm just a pretty boy. I'm redheaded and I'm just a pretty boy, but I'm more than just good looking. God, I'm telling you right now, man, sometimes the power of God comes on me and I can literally tear animals apart with my bare hands. And it happens all the time. And then you know what I do? I go and sleep on the ground afterwards like a baby. And the hand of the Lord is with me. And I'm telling you right now, I'll go down there. I will tear him to pieces. You watch. And Saul went, yeah, let's let this guy go and defeat Goliath. Something happened there. I want, guys, this, this is going to happen within your life where you're going to be in a place and you're like, no, I got this. Everybody's like, no, no, this is not your arena. This can't happen. And you go, no, no, let me tell you what happens with me privately. Because privately, I've been through this same thing over and over and over, maybe at a smaller scale in a different way. And, but I'm telling you, I know how God is in my life when I have to fight these kinds of battles. Friends, I want to tell you, if you don't know that, you're going to have your hat handed to you in the Valley of Elah. You have to know how you walk with God privately in order to publicly demonstrate who the Lord is to you. 
You got to keep count of that. You got to go, hey, man, you know what? I know for a fact I've been in this situation privately and that situation privately and this situation privately. So he was victorious within, he, he was victorious in private. And also, too, he carried his own anointing. Nobody ever seen anything like him. And that was kind of how he, his conversation was, I know you never seen anything like me, but you never seen any, anything like the way that God moves in my life. It's crazy. And all of Israel's fixing to see it. <laughs> it's going to be a good day. Wait till you see this. You got to be able to carry your own anointing. He didn't come in looking like a warrior. He didn't come in armed like an, uh, a warrior. He didn't come in with armor like a warrior. He didn't come in with the skills of a warrior. He came in with how David knew God personally. And he, he was just a unique bird. And I'm telling you, it didn't take very long. And David went, yeah. I see it. They saw it. Something happened in that room that the Bible is not talking about, but they saw it. They went, whoa. Oh my gosh, yeah, yeah, go, go, go. But then before you go, wait, hang on a second. You are representing me and you got to look cool because you really don't look cool. So then he says, and Saul clothed David with his armor and he put a bronze helmet on his head and he clothed him with a coat of mail and David fastened his sword to his armor and he tried to walk, but he never tested that before. He had never practiced that. He goes, this is not a part of my practice. Listen, it's, catch that. Because what happens is people will tell you, okay, listen, this is how you're supposed to fight this battle. This way, this way, this way, this way, this way. And you go, dude, that's not, I, I, I carry a different anointing in my own life. And I've never, I, that's not part of my practice. That's not what I do. And he tells them again, this is not part of my practice because he took it all off in verse 40. Let's go to verse 41. So the Philistine came and he began, uh, I'm sorry, in verse 40, it says he picked up five smooth stones from a brook and he put them in a shepherd's bag. And it says he had his staff in his hand and he put them in a pouch that he had and his sling was in his hand and he drew near to the Philistine. So understand when he comes down to the Philistine, he's got his stick with him, his shepherd's stick. And he has a slingshot, he's got a bag slung over his shoulder, and he's got five stones in it, and he comes walking out there, and that's what he's doing. And so the Philistine came and began drawing near to David, and I can just see that's an interesting thing because that valley is pretty far apart, and he's like, oh, I see a champion down there, I'm gonna go down there and go see him. And he's getting closer and closer and closer and closer and closer, like, what? And it says, and the man... <laughs> And the man who bore his shield went before him. And when the Philistine looked about, and when he saw David, he disdained him because he was only a kid. He was ruddy, which means he was bright red headed and he was good looking. He was a mama's boy. Though he didn't have a mama, he looked like a mama's boy. And he's like, man, look at him. So the Philistine said to David, am I a dog or you're gonna chase me away with that little stick? You know what David said? Sticks and stones. <laughs> he didn't say that I just added that <laughs> and a Philistine cursed David by his God you know the rest of the story is just so awesome but I, I want to just tell you when he walked out there nobody had ever seen anything like this before you know we used the term you know sticks and stones may break my bones right but your words can never hurt me. He went out there literally with sticks and stones fighting the words of this Goliath. It's very interesting to me. And the Philistine said to David, you come to me and I'm gonna give your flesh, I'm gonna give your flesh to the birds there and the beasts of the field. And David said to the Philistine, you come to me with a sword and a spirit and a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel whom you had defied. And then he says this, on this day, he's like right now, this is like right now, real time, the Lord will deliver you into my hand and I'm going to strike you down and I'm taking your head off of them big, hairy, ugly shoulders. And this day, right now, real time, I'm going to give the carcasses of that army behind you to the birds of the air and to the beasts of the field. Uh, so you need to understand, he, he like went a whole nother level because the giant said, I'm going to feed you to the animals. And he said, no, I'm going to cut your head off and I'm going to feed all them to the animals. God, I love David so much. I just think he's the coolest cat ever. 
He's cooler than Davy Crockett. He's amazing. So he comes out and he says, he says, and then all this assembly shall know that the Lord does not save with sword and spear for the battle is the Lord's and he will give you into my hand. So when he, whenever he speaks to the giant, he says, no, no, you don't tell me how things are going to go. I'm going to tell you how things are going to go. And you have to declare and proclaim the word of God and your testimony. Verse 48, and so it was that whenever the Philistines arose and came and drew near to meet David, that David hurried and he ran towards the army to meet the Philistine. Then David put his hand in his bag. Wait, stop. He's running towards this filthy Nephilim beast and he's running towards, oh, wait, I gotta, I gotta load up. <laughs> now that is awesome. It's like, oh yeah, I forgot. I, there's this thing. David put his hand in his bag, took out a stone. He slung it, struck the Philistine in his forehead so that the stone sank into his forehead and he fell on his face to the earth. Boom. And David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and with a stone and struck the Philistine and killed him. So he wasn't dead yet. Now, here's the deal. He didn't go run into battle with a sword because there was already one on Goliath. He said, no, when I get there, there'll be a sword for me. That's a whole different attitude. And he knocks the brother down, and he's like, uh, on his face. And then he takes a sword, boom, stabs him, and grabs him by his head and goes, whoop cha and holds it up and goes, woo, like a dadgum Comanche Indian. <laughs> holds it up. Therefore David ran and stood over the Philistine, took his sword and drew it out of his sheath and killed him and cut his head off with it. Now the way of the giant is to introduce an idea that you are powerless, your defeat is certain, and God will not help you, but the devil is a liar. It's a mind frame, it's a paradigm, it's a way of thinking, it's an inclination that you gotta be able to deal with. It's a worldview. And it's always going to say, it's gonna have its way and it's gonna do what it wants to do, how it wants to do it, when it wants to do it. That's why they didn't enter into the promised land was because the giant, see a giant uses his influence to tell you that you are less than who God Almighty tells you. They didn't enter into the promised land. Why? Because there were, in Numbers 13, 33, that's a 333 scripture. It says, there we saw the giants, the descendants of Anak, and we were like grasshoppers in our own sight. So we were in their sight. How they saw them is how they begin to see themselves. A giant will always offer you a lens of intimidation. And you'll go, oh. I love how it says in the New American Standard, it says, we were in our own sight as grasshoppers, so we were in their sight. And then in the Berean Study Bible, it says, we seem like grasshoppers in our own sight, and we must have seemed the same to them. It's like, well, like, okay, this thing sets a setting that says I had to see myself less than who I am and what I am. But the way of the warrior is to stand where other people won't stand, tell the giant exactly what you're going to do and what God Almighty is going to do, and then, are you ready for this? Go after its head. Yes. Now, the way it thinks, I mean, he went straight for his frontal lobe and told him, hey, man, let me tell you what I'm going to do before I kill this, this army. Can you imagine a kid walking out there? Hey, y'all, before I kill all y'all, I'm going to cut this dude's head clean off. He's after the way he thinks. And I'm going to bury a stone in his frontal lobe, and then I'm going to take his head off. Hmm. His target was specific, 1 Samuel 17, 49. Many times, man, you've got to be able just to ask yourself, why do I think like this, and what has influenced me to think like this? Because this is not what God Almighty is saying. And like, you have to go for the frontal lobe of a giant. You have to go for the reasoning of a giant and quit reasoning after it. All right. Your target has to be so specific. Last week, I was in uh, the Everglades with my two sons. And we have always wanted to, since they were little boys, Daddy, someday I want to go and I want to I catch an alligator. And I'm like, okay, we'll do that someday. Well, my boys are in their 30s now. And I'm like, let's, let's, let's do the old Amos Moses thing and get out there. Let's go see if we can find us an alligator. Let's go see if we can find us a giant. Guys, I want to just tell you, we found us a giant. I want to show you this picture. This is 12 foot, 5 inches long. Mama needs a new pair of boots. 12 feet, 5 inches long, y'all. Now, everybody's like, well, I don't really know if it's that big. Let me show you a picture of Luke sitting on top of it. Yeah, it's big. 
It's big. Now, you can see how far it is to the other side of that canal, and that's where that thing was. And I want to just tell you, when you shoot an alligator, you can't shoot it in the 12 foot 5 inches of body it has. You have to shoot it in what is its forehead right behind its eyes. If it was looking at you like this, it would be above his eyes. Because the brain of an alligator is about the size of three olives. That's it. It's, 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 it's literally, I mean, I saw his brain, so it's like that big. That's it. So when you shoot one of these things, you got to shoot a long ways, and you have to hit a target that is tiny. Um, a friend of mine, our guide, was telling us that there was some, some guys that was out uh, the week before, and this guy had shot this alligator 23 times and couldn't kill it because he couldn't hit that spot. Man, oh, Luke, he made one shot. Boom! It was over. He just rolled over. Like, oh, yes. Now, you got to be target specific, right? Then Ben, that's 12 feet, 5 inches. Now, Ben... He goes out there, same thing. Ben spotted it before anybody else. We're driving around through the Everglades. We're going anywhere on this place that has 380-something thousand acres. And we're driving around. We're doing this cool thing. And it's all day long. And Ben, like, I see one, I see one, I see one. And it's all up in this marsh. And we're looking at it. It's a long ways off. And then it came down in the water. And so it was in the water. And the only thing sticking out was the end of its snout. And then way behind it is two eyeballs. And that's it. So you have to imagine where that tiny spot is behind those eyes and it's submerged under the water. Now, Ben also, because he's sitting on the right side of the vehicle, he has to shoot left-handed out the window and he's not a left-handed guy. And I just was about to say, hey man, this is all wrong. That's too far away. It's under the water. We need this, man, you're going to miss and then you're going to be upset and we can't miss this. And right as I was about to say that, he just went, bam! And it just goes, rode over, first shot. Like, oh my gosh. We drug him up out of the water. He is 11 feet, one inches. That's a one, one, one uh, alligator. He's 11 feet, one inches. And if he didn't die from a shot, he did when Ben sat on him. <laughs> so it's my turn. And we're out in the swamp and it's, you know, it's just a swamp and there's all these big mango, uh, mangroves trees and, and all these stuff. And in these bushes, we can see one. It's, it's pretty far away. And I asked my guide, I said, how big do you think that is? He said, oh, he's 11-ish. I said, well, I, I think he's perfect. So I lined up, said my prayer, pulled the trigger. Bam! Rolled over. Got him. Now, whenever we got down there to him, when we got down there to him, the guy was horrified because he's like, that's closer to 10 feet. That ain't 11 or 12. That's closer to 10 feet. And I'm like, brother, that is a beautiful alligator. I, I love that alligator. And he said, well, we're going to have to measure him and see. And I turned to Ben, and they're busting out the measuring tape. And I said, I'm going to laugh my head off if this thing is nine foot six inches because that's six cubits in a span. Y'all remember that? And Ben's like, okay. And they measured him, and as God is my witness, he is nine foot six inches exactly. Well, when, I, when, we, when we measured it, I turned to my boys, I said, I know what I'm preaching on this Sunday. I know exactly what I'm preaching on this Sunday because God Almighty, this is a prophetic marker for me. That God Almighty has called all of us to be giant slayers and to be target specific and to not line up our mouths and our mind with the enemy, but to line it up with the Most High God. Guys, let's give Jesus a great big praise. Awesome.